like we have a quorum. Everybody's here. Uh, call the meeting to order at 5.33. All right. Uh, is there any adjustments to the agenda? Maybe <clears throat> there's a lot in the business department tonight, and Tara and I have to go to Jihad, so I was going to recommend that we move celebration of learning after discussion items, if that's okay. It'll, it'll buy us a little bit of time. Okay. Um, do we have I, somebody specific coming to do that? No, it's, it's just something you can play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I was going to recommend um, that even though it's under reports to the board, that maybe we do 9.4, 9.5, and 9.6 um, following the celebration and learning, just so that after Tara's report, we can get to the, the budget discussions and things of that nature. Sure. Just to ensure that that she's here for that before Definitely. she leaves. Okay. Um, do we want to assign times and a timekeeper? If we do, I would need help with that. I have no idea how long all these things are going to take. <laughs> I think we've been all right with okay, that. Okay, we'll just go for it then. Okay. All right, then off. Uh, 4.1, we need to appoint a new board chair. I move that Amy be our board chair. I second. <laughs> All right, uh, any discussion? All right, with no discussion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right, all opposed? All right, I guess I'm the new board chair. Congratulations. Amy. <laughs> That's okay, I've got a team behind me, right? You got uh -huh. this. Okay, good. There was no assumption by having the vice chair listed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then we do need to appoint a vice chair. Uh, I move to appoint Bill for vice chair. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? None, no discussion. All in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> Bully gin tonight. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, we need to appoint a full board member. Cause yeah, Ethan was one okay. of your three. Uh, and the three, the two, other two are? It's Bill. It was Ethan, and the third voting member, I thought it was you, Amy. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. Amy and Bill. So then we need another um, full board member for the um, SU board to be a voting member. Um, what? I don't know if this helps. Actually, Patrick, you've been really good about coming to policy committee meetings. The full board meeting is right afterwards. So I, don't know I know. I was, I'm just trying to think if I can... Should be able to. Um, yeah, I think I can do it. I'm All right. I'm I nominate. He's going to coach basketball, too, so I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> That's Tuesdays. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Yes. I, love it. I love it. Okay. On yeah. Tuesdays. Yeah, they're Tuesday nights. I nominate um, Patrick to be our full board chair next month. Yeah. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, Patrick. Mm. Okay. Um, consent agenda, approve the minutes of Thursday, December 8th, 2022. A motion to move those. I read through them, it looks good. <clears throat> And a motion to approve those minutes. So move. Second. Second by Bill. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Great. Those minutes are approved. We move on to number six, public comment. Um, and I don't believe I see any public on. Okay. Great. Uh, then moving on to board comment. I don't know 
know, I think this is, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this, but is there any way we can get the, uh, re the reports and documents any sooner? I feel like I never have any time to put any thought into any of them. I'm like kind of looking while I'm working and stuff on the day of the meeting or the day before. I don't know if, the, I know it's hard, there's a lot of stuff, but I feel like I'm not doing a good job at my study if I can only look at it for a few minutes. You should have received them on, we try to get them out the Thursday before the meeting. That I email, just that, today. You, mm. So you got that as a reminder. We all got but it. You should have all got them when the warning well, comes out, Justine. I don't think it came from Christy. Okay. Yeah, we should come from Christy. And then Ray does that as a reminder the day of. Yeah, we got right. them on the 29th. The 29th. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see anything on the 29th, but. Yeah, 29th at 217. <laughs> to be exact. Okay. I have them open. <laughs> I seen it on my phone and deleted it or something because it comes everything comes on my phone. But I just today I was like, oh, you know, yeah, I have no, seen it. I try to make certain the packet is with the agenda when we post it. Okay. So that's my, I was just. And it is hard to get them before Thursday because, you know, we're, for example, we were prepping two budgets last week. That yeah. both went out Thursday, so I can't promise you anything quicker than the Thursday prior, because yeah. we have board meetings Tuesday night, and then the fall, then agendas go out for the next two districts two days later. So yeah, it's, that makes sense. I think this one I just must have missed, or I haven't looked for it over the weekend, and I couldn't find it. So I, I might have deleted it by mistake or something on my phone. Um, and it was a pretty cumbersome package it was. this it was a lot. time, so there was quite there was quite a bit to get through. Um, so I feel your pain. <laughs> there was oh, yeah. a lot. Oh. Today, you know, today was the first time I thought I noticed it. But okay. Anyway, okay, great. It's good to know that it'll be kind of regularly on the third, you know, at least by the Thursday before. Yeah, you're okay. Monday, so the turnaround we have to warn Thursday really to make certain they're posted. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other board comment? Okay, well then we will move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, so you have my report in hand. Um, the, the only thing I would add, I don't think I mentioned this in my report, and, and Tara will talk about it at length, is that um, as we suspected the CLAs um, in many of our, our district towns have dropped significantly and are up for reappraisal. Um, I think it's going to be really important that as a board and as administration that we are teaming to help folks understand what's driving uh, some of the local district, uh, local town tax rates um, and why there's some discrepancies in our districts. Um, we're seeing significant differences in our uh, unified districts across two towns based on the sale of real estate and how that's impacted the CLAs. Um, and I think sometimes that's that's frustrating for voters because I don't think they understand why is a tax rate different in one town versus another. Um, it's something I'm going to try to do some education materials on over the upcoming months leading up to town meetings. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that is um, I think good for us this year is that our town meetings and votes will be in person. So that will allow us to educate our voters um, before they're voting, yeah. right? Uh, I think sometimes it's hard to understand that if you just get the mailer, but they'll have the presentation to be able to ask those questions in person prior to um, moving a vote, which I think will be helpful. Our, I'm really excited about our, our current strategic plan. Um, it's going to the printer this week, and there'll be um, copies available um, in all of our schools, and we're trying to have them available in town offices and things like that, so folks can um, get hard copies. I pushed out electronic copies last week in a letter to the, our community. Um, and then the other good news I had is I met with the Agency of Education with a, a few other superintendents. I had been and Tara had been uh, concerned about, now that we're in year three of universal free meals, um, we saw a uh, significant decrease in the number of our families that have filled out the free or reduced lunch mm -hmm. application. I was, and, and my colleagues have noticed that too. Um, specifically when we think of our smaller districts as well, right, because they base that off percentages. Well, 10 not being completed this year compared to last year is a lot in your district, right? It's about 10%. So um, not quite, but 
Enough. Point being that it, it's enough that it, it really can impact us. And so I was concerned about it impacting title funding. The good news is the agency is using some other s census data because they recognize that that was going to be an issue. So it won't impact our allocation for Title I funding moving okay. into the, in the next school year. They are working on um, a new form for families to fill out that they're going to be rolling out hopefully soon. They also plan to try to leverage uh, Medicaid data that they have. Uh, regularly available to try to better get an estimate of um, right because maybe they could use those yeah, numbers rather those than numbers, families yes. having to do it at this level yeah. that would be pretty amazing so stay tuned on all that uh, the good news is they've recognized there's an issue with it um, and I am appreciative that they're they're working on some planning around how to address it because um, it was certainly concerning for us as you'll see in the revenue line we certainly budget title funding here yeah. to offset mm -hmm. some expenditures. So otherwise, I'll take any questions folks may have. Bill? <clears throat> so a comment, I totally agree with the importance of educating uh, the public um, and educational communities about common level of appraisal, CLA, and it's complicated. And uh, so we need to get a message that's understandable and clear and then we need to look at ways um, to get the word out as many different avenues as we can. And I really appreciate you taking a proactive point of view on that. The other part of that, and I keep talking about, is income sensitivity, that two-thirds of our households pay their school tax based on their income rather than on the value of their property. And so that provides a cushion unique to Vermont so that um, school costs don't go off the charts. Uh, how do you do a good job if you keep cutting and cutting and cutting? It's just mission impossible. So I think I would encourage us to look at ways that we also can tell that story as well. But thank you very much. I think that education piece is just key to, be, for, to help people understand yeah. um, how the numbers that we're showing actually really affect them and why. Yep. All right. Any further questions for the superintendent? Great. Um, move on to the principal's report. Um, so the first report is my normal report in front of you. Um, it doesn't seem like a while since we've had kiddos in the building. So, <laughs> um, but I will say a big focus of what was December and then again what will be January is we will roll out our direct instruction literacy programming to students starting tomorrow. Um, so all our staff have been trained They'll be coaching starting this Friday with Janie right away. Um, so it'll be great uh, to see that going. And it's also kind of an ideal time because we'll also do what's called the Dibbles assessment again during the month of January. So we'll get, which uh, gives us data on students' ability to do code words. So it'll give us a good baseline around where we are and how that um, instruction improves uh, for our students. Uh, their ability to decode words. Um, the other thing I think that's pretty exciting is we've been teaming with the occupational therapist who comes to our school to focus on some handwriting work as well, um, using what's called the Size Matters handwriting program. And it's uh, there's a lot of research out there that shows students' inability or struggles with writing really comes from their handwriting or right. not understanding how to write, or it's not comfortable. It can be a lot of different things. So um, the occupational therapist comes in and team teaches with the teacher on like different strategies to use and what's, you know, having your feet flat on the floor, all those fun things Great. going from there. And it's about 10 to 15 minutes a day, and it's called Star Worthy. Uh, <laughs> make your letters and numbers star worthy so they can tell you what's a star worthy uh, number or letter when they write it. That's the little kid, the younger version. Um, and then we will start winter wellness up starting on the 13th, and that'll be all our said students, uh, first through sixth grade together at PICO, and then our kindergarten uh, kids will get together from both buildings and do snowshoeing and ice skating. Right, and Hopefully some cross country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure if it might be a little local hike uh, <laughs> next week if there's still no snow. Okay, snow. Yeah, for here, but it looks like we're supposed to get some. Right. Uh, and so if there aren't questions about that, I can move on to the social emotional data. Any questions uh, regarding the principal's report? 
Great. I'm going to move on. Okay. So um, in front of you, what you have is our social emotional data, which, um, you know, ODRs, so office discipline referrals. Um, there is a little key, but it's kind of at the bottom, so we'll go uh, further down. Um, and if you're working your way left to right, the 2020, years is color coded, 21 is blue, okay, and then uh, red is 21, 22, and um, in 2021, we were full. Back yeah, back fully masked. Exactly. Very. That was the first. Yep. Okay. First year. That was the return back. Okay. That was the return. Yep. And then 2021 would be last year, and yep. then 2022 to 23 is this no. year. So it's important to just say that 20, 2020 and 2021, and then 21 and 22. That's for the entire school year. That data that you're looking in front of you versus 22. 2022 right. to 2023 is through December. It's just September through December. September through December. Um, so this is actually how we break it out for our social emotional teams. We have two teams. We have our what's called our PBIS team, um, which meets monthly and reviews this data as well as, and you'll see it in the celebration of learning, like our hands or our ticket counts and our celebrations. But what we focus on is kind of the why. What makes sense about this? Why is Wednesday a harder day versus Monday? Like you see um, here uh, in the day a week. So we break it down by day a week, uh, the month. It's always fascinating that November is hard, but um, as I mentioned in my report, we find that there's a lot of stop and go in November. There's a lot of short weeks. Yeah. Um, and that does make a difference for kiddos that's harder. What's the number on the left? Is that the percentage or? That's the number. It's not a percentage. It's like the actual count. Gotcha. Yep. Um, as well as location. And one of our big focal points coming back in the new year is around how we've taught playground expectations. What we're finding is um, students are using hands-on, not necessarily like fist fights, but just instead of words, we're putting hands on a lot. We're not um, mm. following the expectations. So we're trying to reteach model with examples so they understand what it looks like. And it's just a learning curve for a lot of kids to be able to use words in a kind way uh, as well. And then um, the popular one uh, that we focus a lot on is by gender, male versus female breakdown. It's pretty common and has been a trend for us for several years now that there's more um, it, more office discipline referrals for males versus females. Um, so typically what we do is then we have a targeted team that reviews these office discipline referrals, like specifics, by, by student, by space, to really make sure um, there's not other supports we need to put in place for a student and or um, that we don't need to put, we don't need to change how we're doing things as adults. It could be twofold, right? It could be we're not explaining something the right way. It could be transitions are hard. It could be a wide variety of things. And the targeted team really works specifically looking at a student's attendance data, how frequently they're in the nurse's office, the bathroom, right, um, all that, the whole thing. the whole picture That's to come up. PBS, PBS That's team. called a targeted, Target. our targeted social emotional team. Okay. Our PBIS is like the whole, looks at this from the whole class. Okay. But then the targeted team starts to Dive narrow in. it okay. down and help come up with a support plan. Um, I would say um, the other big thing around this is we're really working on self-regulation skills or zones of regulation skills with students. So there's green zone, the blue zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone, and we're trying to work, and there's different emotions that fit in each of those zones. Ideally, you're in the green zone when you start a day. That's not the case for some of our friends, but we work on different strategies to help students get to the green zone. And then yellow or red is like you're frustrated, you're angry, and then red is you're out of control with your body. And we're trying to head some of that off using what's called our peace place or our peace corner, um, where a teacher or student can self-direct to that in the classroom. And then we also have what's a yellow or a red pass to help identify what zone 
uh, an adult or student might feel like they're in, and then they can take that space outside of the classroom. It's only for about five to 10 minutes, and then they go back in. Mm -hmm. So working on some, yeah, exactly. Working on some preventative, proactive measures and not just reactive. She has used that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a good yeah, strategy. She, she actually had good feedback about yeah. it, so yeah. Yeah. It is it's cool. It was it was good to hear that like from her. Right. The ki I think kids wrap their brains around it easier than adults do, yeah. meaning like they don't see it as a, a time to play it, yeah. or a time of discipline. They yeah. see it as an opportunity to reset yeah. and restart and go back and, and join the group. that's how it felt when she was telling me about it. And yeah. it's actually harder to get adults to wrap their brain around well, that. It, it, exactly, because like, at first I was like, huh, what? There's fidgets, <laughs> there's, you know. Um, <laughs> Right, it's just perception right. is totally different. It's just when you're different the, than when all of us were in school. Too. Yeah, right. yeah. So I yeah. think that's a very positive way because that's what it's all about. Is, right, is, is positive encouragement for mm -hmm. to do yeah. it, do it yeah. right way. Well, we right. All, yeah, no, that's really great. And you really can't great. access your learning, and sometimes your classmates can't access their learning if they're if you're not in the right space to learn. Mm -hmm. right. So, really trying to focus on some of those skills because what we've found is just the lack of outside activities that came with COVID. Those are other social interactions that kids used to have that now are coming back, but they haven't had for a couple of years. And that makes a huge difference in what, mm -hmm. what they know how to do when they interact with their friends. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. some pretty um, <clears throat> crucial time there in their development that things right. changed. And exactly. So, um, right. no, this, that's great. Um, that sounds like a good way to go forward. Now, if we could just get siblings to get along. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, I have no magical uh, insight on that, Man. other than it's probably been a long vacation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, any questions about that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, or a couple of questions. Um, is outdoor ed considered the classroom or other on this chart? Yep, outdoor ed is considered, do, 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 it's considered other location. Okay. Not Thank classroom. You. And the other question is, has the targeted team looked into any correlation between the um, academic topic? In the classroom, and when these ODRs so are happening, it, we will like during the different time of the day when they're doing certain types right. Of, uh, yep. So outside of um, the playground, like taking recess out of the picture. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. In the classroom. Yeah, right. in the classroom. Um, one of the bigger times of struggle is when transitioning from one activity to another. It's not necessarily yes, a specific true. academic content area. There was. I think it was last year, you could pinpoint it from like 10 to 11 was a very hard time for pretty much huh. most of our students. And um, sometimes it's avoidant. So this office discipline referral form has like, what would be the motivation? Would it be avoidance? Would it be attention seeking? What could be the why behind it? Are they hungry? Right. <laughs> Are they hungry? It could right. be a lot of things. So um, okay. yeah, That's so right, right now it's mostly transitions. And uh, getting really, really excited is the way I would describe it, to go to whatever the next thing is, usually to a special or to a uh, short recess or longer recess. And that's when um, most of our students struggle with some body control and following directions. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. What about the other side of the spectrum as far as, rather than getting too excited about the next uh -huh. subject? Avoiding it. Or not wanting to leave what they're doing um, and having a hard time walking away from it, and yeah, sometimes not as not, not as, as much. much. But, yeah. Mm -mm. That, that zones work though that they do with Miss Sam will work on that. Yeah. So part of what they also identify in there is like we call it that we get like stone brain, like we just, and what that means is they just get stuck, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, and so we try to teach them to be super flexes, these characters within the curriculum and super flex is right. about becoming more flexible, right? So like if I'm really engaged in something and don't want to transition, then some language that teachers could use to cue in is like, I'm seeing that you're pretty stuck right now. How could we get you unstuck? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, can we yeah. become like think about super flex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, neat. I had a question. Just um, 
comparing different elementary schools of our SU. Um, is this look familiar around, or, or one question, is this anomaly, or uh, all our elementary schools are, are struggling right now in this respect? And then secondly, do teachers and principals exchange ideas and information about what's working there to, to, to move um, or lower the, the columns of, of uh, number of, of times that kids uh, misbehave? Is there, a, is there anything that we need to learn on this one, or is it just, not just, or is it we're doing everything possible? Well, I would say that schools across the country are struggling right now with behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that, you know, I think one of the reasons why I think this data could have increased too, and, and I appreciate Lindy didn't go there, I do think that maybe folks are getting better actually recording the data mm -hmm. and not just sending kids out. So I would say that I think that this is probably a more accurate view of how much yeah. you've had for office referrals in the past but that we've gotten a lot better about being diligent about documenting it so we can use it. Um, and, you know, we have some schools, like I just saw a data report that's coming in next week where, you know, they average about 1.5 referrals a day. Um, that's really good. I mean, the target range, you know, PBIS would say is a school that is our size. Ideally, we would have about two referrals mm -hmm. a day. Um, and so I don't know what this data breaks off to if you broke down the average office discipline referral It's a day. little bit higher than So it's, it's higher Not than much. that. But, um, you know, as far as collaborating, the principals in the SU all get together weekly without central office there. So I'm assuming this maybe comes up. I can't yeah. speak for Lindy. But the one thing we do at central office is that Michaela Martin, our intensive programming system support coordinator. Some of you have met her at the full board level, um, Bill, during our mm -hmm. MTSS presentation. She sits on all of our target and intensive teams great. across the SU to be able to share ideas mm -hmm. and just to also remind resources that we have across the SU. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it can, you can forget like, oh yeah, we do have a board certified behavioral analyst through Claire Martin that serves the SU, who comes here and does yep. functional behavioral assessments on students and helps build behavior plans. But she's there just to remind those teams about the other resources that we have outside of just the building um, that our SU wide resource mm -hmm. is. Thank you. Right. Uh, any other questions uh, for Lindy regarding the social emotional data report? Great, then we'll move on to the business manager. So you all have my report. The only update I have since I wrote the report was on Friday, Stockbridge was awarded the Fresh Fruit, Fruit and Vegetable Program grant from the Child Nutrition team. So they mm -hmm. have $3,450 that they can utilize um, when they come back this month through the remainder of the school year to continue to have fresh fruit and vegetables in the classroom and to run the educational programs that we have in the past for that. Rochester was awarded earlier. Um, it's based on your free and reduced percentage. So as grant funds are awarded, they start at the higher level. And then as there's additional funds available, they reduce the free and reduced percentage allowability. So Stockbridge is now eligible and was awarded. Which is another reason for people to fill out those forms. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's my only other update outside of what's already there. If there's any questions. Obviously, it's a busy time of year. Is there any questions for the business manager regarding her report? If not, we are going to be moving on to the 10-1, yep. the draft budget. All right, so you all have the next draft of your expenditure budget. So what is different in this one versus what you saw last month? Um, I met with Eric at EEI on Thursday, and we went through all the financials again. So in this draft, you see there is the 15-year performance lease added. And I used to that location. Um, Page. I don't have it printed in front of me. Go next one. 2610. So 2610. 2610. Yep. Seven. Page seven. So if we all look at the uh, in uh, 
orange. There's where the main numbers are. I mean, six, ten. Please. Is that what it is? Sorry, no. Last page. Page eight. Yep. 5020 is your object code debt services. Added 15 year performance lease. 5020. Yep. Okay. So page eight, you'll see where it's been added. I reduced what you wanted to transfer into your capital reserve fund by the amount of the 15 year performance leases. So under function code 2610, which is your operations of building, you will see savings are reflected on in the comments, the notes on the side, um, savings at each elementary for upgrade, increase propane for upgrade, increase due to adding high school savings at each elementary for upgrade. Um, so you'll see those notes have all been added into this draft. And then the SU assessment has been updated based on the approved budget for the SU that was done at the board meeting at the end of December. So that's also in there now at the appropriate assessment percentage. Your transportation is still um, a projection because um, we will have to go out for bid um, for our transportation contract. We were hoping for an extension, but they're unable to do that. So we will do a bid for them. And so that right now is just a, a placeholder until we get the actual bid results. And how many years was is the contract usually? Um, we were coming off a five year. A five year, okay. So that's what's different on your expenditure budget. Can and you wait on that? Just ask a question. Can we move on? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. um, help me here on, on fund recommended fund transfer to capital assets. That's what we was that the sixty five thousand yeah. dollars we had before. Yeah, and I reduced that. It has to be reduced because some of the savings that we were budgeting for on the second go around it seemed to be a little robust, so we were being more conservative there. We changed it because I needed to add in your performance lease, so you don't have that full sixty five thousand debt service available. Yeah, but we because of the lease, we were able to adjust other lines yeah. to the yeah. savings. Yep, which you had. Okay. Okay. The, Just so I that. Thank you. I'd like the, for the board to consider um, our goal, because I think we're pretty united on the importance of building up a capital fund to do what's necessary. And in too many times, and I've been on boards where, quote, we can't afford it and we kick it down the next next year, whether it's a, a vehicle or whether it's a, a building. And I'm concerned that 65 was not, 1,000 was wonderful, but it certainly isn't robust. We could use considerably more than that. I encouraged that last time we met. So I would like to, at some point, have the board focus on whether or not we want to amend that fund transfer amount, uh, at least get it back to the 65 that was originally proposed by the superintendent, and, um, and get some feedback from uh, Tara and the superintendent on whether that puts us in a la la land and has some unintended consequences or something like that. But I, um, we just, we need to lay away some monies. Um, and we got an aging plant, uh, Patrick knows, and Robert far more than I do. But so, Amy, however you want to handle that, I'd like to have a discussion on that at some point. Yeah, I think now would be yeah. the time. I, yeah. mean, okay. I think this was, you know, Tara's adjustment was based off of just the CLA, yeah. right? And I'm Stockbridge. very concerned about the CLA. Um, so know that that certainly informs yeah. some of that decision making. And the savings still are pretty good. I mean, really the savings that you're gonna see in some of your efficiencies around propane and things, we're only talking about five, about, what was it, about $5,500 a year difference. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, this budget's actually down a little bit. Um, okay. on that that side of it because we didn't add as much into the fund transfer. Um, you know, it's just, it's really hard for me to get a sense of where our communities are at. Like two years ago, I, I mean, I felt like we had to be at a 3% budget, right? That's not, with inflation and increases in tuition and things, that's not realistic right now by any means. It's just, I don't have a good pulse. I, that's where I would look to the board for me to help have a sense of where our communities are. I just, I don't have a good sense right now. And we haven't had, a, you know, I think 
the communities feel like we're doing a pretty good job on the educational end and we haven't had as much public in general at my board meetings. So throughout this budget season, I haven't had a lot of direct feedback from folks in the community about where they're feeling. Um, I've got budgets right now throughout the SU anywhere from like 3.8% up to almost 10% right now on expenditure budgets. So we are all over the map and you know, we're at five, tuitions five. and things are, are we're at generating 5 .5 some of that. But. Part of the conversation is the fact that um, Stockbridge's CLA went down 14%. Oh, yeah. okay. So that um, makes a, quite of an increase when you get down to that specific homestead tax rate. Um, I, I hear, Bill, though, that we need to be saving for our buildings. It's, mm -hmm. It is of, of importance, and I think it's kind of a juggling act. Um, Essentially, what we, by lowering it the way we did, it's almost two pennies is about what it is. Because if you go to your your tax sheet form, 28000 is a cent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. You know, the difference is about two cents. Between Meaning if you went back to the 65,000 versus two what cents is in this budget. Okay. Looking at it that way, I mean, what do as Stockbridge residents sit with, with the, um, I mean, that's why I throw it out that way, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's, we know what cents, we're talking about. Look at how much it's up already. Stockbridge is up 17. Mm -hmm. up almost, 17. almost 18, 18 cents mm -hmm. because well, of the CLA. Um, yeah, because of the CLA. I, I want to specify that because of your CLA. Your actual equalized tax rate went down. Which is crazy. And that's because your yield's up also over it's two good. grand. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that that's huge, uh, but. And our equalized I mean, pupils are start putting the money away like that, I feel like. We sooner than later we we need to do like the, the campus walk around, figure out the improvements that need to be made. That way we can then dictate that to the to the community Same that hey we have look at this list that we need to start. Well, we know the big list, right? Yeah, like so that I was mean, part of the EI's original assessment. You have that. Patrick. Yeah. So we why know can't we? Sh there's roofs. The strategic plan has some big items in it so for your two districts. We need to link the two buildings. together, essentially saying, we have this, so we need to plan you know, for this. Rather than just say, hey, we put $65,000 away. Right, we, and the community going, whoa, what for, why? Well, here's you know, our list. We're going to yeah, start, like, we have room. Share that before it becomes a conflict. I agree. <clears throat> but how, you know, how? Yeah, and, if, and again, I took, Part of the nice thing about EI's assessment was it gave us a punch list. And so you'll see in the strategic plan, some of those big items are listed in each one of your buildings mm -hmm. for the next six years. Is there and it's going to need 65000 every year yeah. to even try to remotely get there, right? Like, yeah. So I'm a proponent of putting it away. I also, I don't think we under, I also understand like that folks are, are it's hard times right like i get it going to the grocery store is really expensive um so i i just i think that's where i'm looking to the board to just make some decision this is yep. you know and i i've always said to you this is your biggest policy statement right like the budget we also increased some ftes based on the board's request like you could reinvest those FTEs back into the, your reserve, your building reserve fund. You have some, like you can make some decisions here without even necessarily having to add even more to the tax rate is my point, right? Like there's. But, I mean, you're, you're, in one case we're investing in personnel and the other in, in investing in, in buildings. And in the 30, what is it, 32, 33 years since they started being on boards, uh, over and over again, we kick the stuff down down the road, you know, and we have deferred maintenance. And this is making, I mean, putting in 65,000 is, you just say straight out, if we don't put this away, we're going to have to defer maintenance. And then it becomes exponentially more expensive, too. Right. Yes. Yes. Just say so, this is yeah. it's bookkeeping trips. It's just like maintaining your home. I mean, you can put off staining your siding, and then eventually mm -hmm. you're going to have to mm -hmm. replace Place your siding. So. Do we have any um, surplus that is that it's in your revenue budget? 
Right now, your projected surplus for FY22 is 169,000. I use 69,000 as offsetting revenue with the intention of putting in your warning again to re put the remaining surplus mm -hmm. into your reserve funds. Which would be 100,000. Yep, if you did 50, So we 50, would be immediately putting 100,000 100, into that capital improvement from this surplus. Or we could put 65 more in to the budget and line item 65 uh, back out yeah. as well. Um, kind of does the same thing. It's, it's hard, and, and what am I, an older guy, and uh, kids are growing up, and so I don't know, I can't speak for the town, it just, I know from experience in that if we don't keep up a physical plant, okay. uh, we're gonna pay for it, and uh, not only us, but the kids and the teachers in a dilapidated plant. And secondly, once you've established a level of reinvestment every year, mm -hmm. say 65,000, yeah. there's no, it, it's accepted. Mm -hmm. It's when you wait, 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 and then all of a sudden you got a blip. Everybody's going, what? Right. So I think I'd propose, at least at this juncture, that we, um, we amend this back to the original Proposal by our superintendent um, of sixty-five. Um, and, uh, the sixty-five thousand. As you say, it is a it's a statement. Yeah, so I mean, we've got very articulate um, people on this board that can speak to that. Um, would we want to uh, entertain putting more of the surplus back in then to help um, offset that that revenue, and which would just a little bit less into the building reserve fund, so. I'd love to have the building reserve fund show 65K. Now, how Correct. we get there is is whatever, but that's what we, it seems to me, so we can show. This is balanced budget every year we're putting away. And um, I guess um, what, was, what is proposed now is that there's 100,000 that would go in from our surplus, mm -hmm. projected, right. projected, it's not audited, um, uh, not audited, not audited. that would go into that building oh, okay. in addition to the 65 that we're putting in our budget. I kind of, I do think that putting it as a line item in a, our budget as 65 is a statement saying that we are investing and we want to continue to invest. I would yeah. maybe suggest that we reduce some of the um, surplus and add it back mm -hmm. in as some revenue, so we're not um, hitting that you know, I, too much. To, now, the 65, was that a recommendation by you? Yeah. Now, I mean, was that a number? It was what that, the lease was. So, so your bond it, it, was in, it was in your bond It was what yeah. our bond payment right. so was. Okay. Adding. It wasn't. I, I guess was for me, it's, you know, rather than just picking a number, we kind of need to know what these, co like. The cost. We, got, we need to have a 10-year plan, and then, Budget for it. Yeah, we can't just pick a number every year. We you know, got to have projects associated with it, and, but also growing the you know growing the account while taking care of improvements each year. So we had been spending sixty five thousand for the past well the, the, our entire time mm -hmm. as uh, the RCD. Um, that was in our budget, and so that to spend each year, you're saying it was in our budget. It was you, we, it was to pay the bond debt service. So it was a bond payment. It was gotcha. in there, and so right. instead of taking it out, they would just said, okay, well, let's okay. leave it in there and make it and turn it into the capital expense. Okay. Instead, just okay. Yeah, I was kind of piggybacking on what Patrick was talking about, and um, and what Jamie had asked about what Stockbridge thinks. And I feel like if we're going to be educating the public on this particular topic, I don't know if there could be a further breakdown between the buildings that could be shared or um, in addition to be very clear that this isn't for repairing the high school building. I think it seems very obvious to people like us that that's not what it's for. But I think people, certain people who might not be paying attention other than chit-chatting at the grocery store or, you know, they. I think just we have to be very clear to kind of put that out there because I think that just the word building in the town of Stockbridge gets a little bit of... Well, the funny um, language that you're going to have in your warning is specific to what they passed as your voters last year. They established the Rochester Stockbridge Capital Improvements and Maintenance of Facilities Fund. 
So when we ask voters to put the surplus there, that is the fund we will be using now. It won't be for the individual locations like you had last year, because that's why we established that. So we can even put right in the budget itself here where you see it says transfer to capital asset fund. I can name that very specific, the RSUD capital assets fund, so that it is identified that it is a district-wide fund. That no. sounds good to me. And just, yeah, I mean, just I, in, if we're going to educate the public, I just mm -hmm. feel like just the word building is an inflammatory word. Thank you. Average. And I so, feel like the education needs to be a combined community education, not no. Stockbridge, mm -hmm. Rochester. Mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely. think that's a great idea, too. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. I, I agree. Um, so I think um, we're clear that we would like to go ahead and put that Oh, we wanna, do we, you want the, the some of your FTE increases where we're not ad, administrative. Right. Okay. Right. We like didn't recommend Like the library, that. I think, was one. Okay. Library I have to just want to go back and read so, I mean, your needs. I mean, we want to support you in education. That could be. That's like 14 grand. Yeah. Right I mean, That's as okay. administration, we did, there was a couple, like that example of the FTE increase was not something that Lindy had requested. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean she can't utilize it, but right. in general, there could be some funding there that could go back toward this as well. So there could be an opportunity for us to play with the revenue some and look at that, get that back up to 69 and not have even more increase in tax rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think voters vote a couple ways when they're in. Now, being in front of us, I think helps, right? But I think my experience is they vote bottom line expenditure increase, because they don't understand all the other stuff, right? And they vote based on their tax rate, because at the end they can figure out what that is at the bottom. Now, we, it's our job to, in, to educate them what that bottom line expenditure gets them for programming and for their investment in the infrastructure, and for us to help them understand that their tax rate's not all driven by our expenditure budget. There's a whole lot of other figures in there. And I feel better about where, where, where we sit right now because we are gonna be able to be in front of folks. I would be very fearful throughout my whole SU right now, the way the CLAs have gone, if we were in Australian ballots and folks were just voting based off of the question in front of them and or whether or not they happen to attend our informational meeting or happen to read our materials we put forward, right? Um, so I feel better knowing that we're going to have, we're, we're going to have a captive audience that we get to educate mm -hmm. um, before they move the vote that evening. And I think that that does serve us well. Great. I'm feeling like I have direction for us to work on the next mm -hmm. draft. Okay. Yeah. Great. I guess. Okay. So we briefly touched on your revenue side. Um, just what we use for the prior year surplus. I've made adjustments to your tuition revenue um, based on the number of students we had this year. So I dropped that down from 22 students to 18 students. This is As right now. Enrollment. Yep. This is right now using your FY23 rate because one of your action items tonight is to approve your FY24 rate. So once you've done that, I will adjust um, any necessity there on the tuition side. You have six students in at, for pre-K. What's that pre-K rate now? Because that's set by the state, right? Three thousand seven hundred sixty-four dollars, and that is set by the agency. And then the other adjustment I made on your revenue side was I increased the forestry grant based on your FY23 grant amount. And then down on your other grants, you'll see that there's an adjustment been made on the school-wide consolidated federal program, Title I, which is based on um, the FTE that is funded in the budget, and then also um, the Medicaid revenue um, from the SU has been adjusted um, based on the nurse funding in the budget. On your tax sheet, Hold the way. Amy? Yes. Uh, is this a good time for you to give us a quick 
briefing on your analysis on the trust funds that are under our school board's um, control, and I thought you had a recommendation for yeah, um, I, I, for for us that would increase our um, revenue budget. You well, shouldn't put those funds in the revenue budget. That's right. something Amy and I discussed um, because the way these special revenue funds work is it should be handled the same way that your capital reserve funds are used. Lindy should come to you as the administrator with a plan and a specific request for the utilization of those funds because that's what our auditors are looking for. You're allowed X number of dollars based on how the funds grow each year and Amy gets that report and she's done a phenomenal job pulling these all together uh, but it shouldn't it is not a guaranteed revenue because if the fund doesn't perform, you don't have those funds available. So then you're budgeting for a revenue that you potentially don't get. Where if they're treated as a reserve, as a special revenue fund, similar to your reserve funds, it is safer. That's my word of caution on putting it in your budget. And, and you've um, been lucky every year that Stockbridge has given you $9,000. Right. But if their funds don't perform, they could turn around one year and say no. We can't give you this money this year. Well, also, this, the one of the funds specifically talks about not uh, putting anything towards brick and mortar. And when right. you're dumping everything into the revenue budget, I mean, it's hard to it gets muddy. Mm -hmm. yep. So yes, there is funds that um, I feel that we're going to be able to use um, for specific things. And I think it, you know, and I think every year at this point we can. All right, we've got, you know, here we're going to be able to have this much for funds, so you don't have to put it in the budget. We're going to be able to do these programmings, you know, with this other way. Thank you, Bill. Yep, thanks. Any other questions on the revenue at this point? We'll move on to. Sorry, I'm just watching time. Yep, keep watching time. You, you go, and I'll you keep staying here. It's a, and I'll go. Thank you. Yep. So, on your tax sheet, I'm going to start right up at the top because I know we have a new board member down there who this might all be new for. <laughs> well, it's, I'm seven years old since I've been on a board, so. Oh, okay, you're you rusty. So you have some here. experience. I have some, Fantastic. but I'm very rusty. <laughs> <laughs> so on your tax sheet, we start right at the top. So we look at what your expenditure budget is. Thank you, Parker. Which is your $4,722,040. Oh, mine's different. Sorry, because I just made a change on this. Can I look at, can yeah. I look at your sheet? I was that, like, is you that clear? Bottom, <laughs> is that bottom yes. line on the Yes, because I already made the $65,000 adjustment. <laughs> You're like, get it done right now. <laughs> okay, so yes. Yeah, so looking at what I gave you in your packet, you've got the $4,675,447. And then we take your offsetting revenue, which is what we just went through quickly on the revenue side. Offsetting revenue is any local revenue. So anything you're getting that is not from the state education fund. So that's where that number comes from. And we reduce the expenditure budget by that amount. And then that gives us our Act 68 education spending, which is $3,812,841. And you divide that by your equalized pupil. And you'll see in FY23, your equalized pupil was 175.95. And we have a projected increase in first draft of our equalized pupil from the agency. It's not the final yet. But right now, we're at 181.29. That's great. Hey. So you divide your Act 68 education spending by your equalized pupil. And that gives you your education spending per pupil cost, which is $21,288.73. Oh, sorry, looking at the wrong one again. $21,000.72. And then that is then divided by the yield, which you'll see is $15,479 per the December 1st tax letter. And as you recall, that does change throughout the year based on what they do with the education fund and if they keep all the surplus and the ed fund in taxes, that will stay pretty consistent, but we had three different yields last year. Right. So we could see the same trend this year. But that, the governor has recommended that they put it, yeah. all of it in. Yeah, but it's up to the, yeah. okay. the committees. Um, so we divide that, and then that gives you your equalized tax rate, which is 1.3587. So you'll see that that is a reduction from the current, which is 1.4512. 
So we're, we're reducing, yeah. actually. Yep. Yeah. So in your <laughs> under, like, if the so threshold penalty still was in action, you would be under the threshold because the threshold this year was twenty-two thousand two hundred and four dollars. But they're not. There's, that's not on the table right now. There's a okay. a hold on the penalty until 2029 right now, but that is not hmm. safe. Yep, okay. Or AOE under. thinks it's coming back, so hmm. just don't know when. We're under. All right, so <laughs> you're under, and that's all that matters. So uh, non-residential tax rate, that's also set by the tax department. That is currently projected to be 1.64, so you'll see that in that projection as well. So then we move down to each of the individual towns. So you'll see in Rochester, the CLA was 95.63 last year. This year it is 87.01, so it's a reduction of 8.62 percentage points. So then that brings the homestead tax rate in Rochester to 1.5616, which is an increase of 0 0.0441 over the current. In Stockbridge, their CLA dropped from 90.10% to 75.98%, so 14.12 percentage points. When it falls under 85%, it triggers a necessity for a reappraisal. And didn't they just get an appraisal done? I don't know when their last one was. Maybe Bill. I thought it was reason. Rochester. Yeah. I, I think it was recent. I think Lori said that it was yeah. completed in June of 2020. Yeah. So it does necessitate yeah. by yeah. statute that they and have a reappraisal. And that's just from so many sales above, above what the mm -hmm. market value is because of COVID. <laughs> so that gives you a Stockbridge homestead tax rate of 1.7883 which is an increase of 17.76 cents. Yeah. And the new numbers is 19.9 yeah, cents. That hurts. That's what I've got here. <laughs> we sit and play. Which is crazy that we have actually reduced the tax rate to, uh, by what was last year's by how many by right here on the top corner nine. by nine by nine cents we've actually reduced the tax rate by nine cents but because of the CLA it has increased Stockbridge's by 17 cents and Rochester's by four cents I think Rochester's went down last year right and Stockbridge only went up a penny maybe oh it was pretty slim last year yeah I do remember um, that much. The merger um, incentives, is this the first year we don't have any of no, those? No, that went away last year. It went away last year? year. Okay. Ouch, yeah, that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's where the numbers fall, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. I mean, that's all you can say. So last year it was uh, with the final yield, Rochester went down seven cents, and Stockbridge went down point zero zero three four. I think one of the things that we're talking about, we've got a responsibility of telling the story yep. as accurately and clearly and forcefully as we can between now and May. And one story is the last four lines on this page. Per purpose spending has gone down $1,700 per kid. Right. So that tells another story. They were increasing our educational outcomes and yeah. performance. And meanwhile, we're, we're reducing our costs. No, I think no, it went up. So, um, that's an increase. Seventeen hundred. Excuse me. That's an increase. Seventeen hundred. Because they're proposing that oh. people's oh, okay. excuse me. Oh, excuse me. I missed. I uh, boy. Yep. No, it went from nineteen to twenty-one thousand. Yeah, it went up. Sorry. Was, and that right good. now is the language that's in the warning. Okay. So VASBO Superintendents Association. VASBO is the Vermont Association of School yeah. Business Officials. We are asking the legislature to consider changing the statute warning mm. for the budget article because that is what it focuses on now. It's not what your actual budget increase is. Yeah. It's right. the cost and it just makes of it your confusing. per pupil spending and what that increases. So that oftentimes confuses voters. Yeah. 
um, because it's not the per pupil cost is what is shown. Your, your primary budget line plus the per pupil cost and the percentage increase versus what the tax rate increase is or what the equalized tax rate is for merged districts. So. Thank you for that correction. Well, I am very proud at what we've accomplished as yeah. a school, as a district. I think we are going in an incredibly great direction. We've, we've increased in learning, we've increased um, our English, yep. reading, we're working on math, um, and unfortunately it does cost some money to do that. Yep, yep. You can't be held responsible for the CLA. I mean, you know, you got to try to convey this top big picture of all the work you've mm. done to keep things low and still increase programming. You know, the CLA thing is going to be a tough, tough thing to explain. Mm -hmm. As a lister, I could try and maybe help get some language, too, for Jamie. <laughs> yeah, and I, I put a, quite a section in my letter, but I don't know how many people actually, you know, read my letter in the annual mailer, but I do talk about what, how it is and how it impacts your tax rates. So we do try to make sure it's out there. And if you're, like, our presentation that we gave last year, if you remember, I had an entire slide about the CLA. Yeah, I, I changed some. Yeah. And I think that is really impact. important because I think, you're, you know, all letters are wonderful, but, you know, there's a certain amount of people get through so much of it, right. and that's mm -hmm. not what this sticks a lot out. So of just some big bullet points <laughs> yep. are sticking out. Um, so I do think it'll be really important when we do our presentation this year that we, again, we focus on those areas of the presentation yeah. and that it's there for the community when they come. To, to hear yeah. the meeting. I agree. Um, is there any other questions regarding the tax sheet for Tara? Um, do you, um, or on the budget or at all? I know you have another meeting to run to, but you can come back. So, yeah, we've got the audit update next. Okay. Uh, do you want to do that yep. before I leave? And okay. then yes. your yeah. announced tuition is 10.5. I don't know if you moved that one up. I can't remember if you moved that one up or not. I think we bundled all of your stuff together. Okay. So as far as the 21-22 audit, I have first draft of almost all of the district's audit. I do have first draft of yours. I have gone through it. I have sent back corrections to the auditing team um, for the next draft. We are also working through corrections in the supervisory union's audit, which obviously will have any impact on all of the districts based on any reassessment that we have to do at the close of the fiscal year. Okay. So those are currently the two outstanding items. The big one for you um, was the insurance refund for the high school claim didn't come in in the same fiscal year. Ah. So we have to make sure like all of those documentations are supported. Yeah. Um, and I'm working with the new adjuster that has been assigned to the claim to make sure all of that stuff is appropriately documented so that the auditors can accommodate for that in your audit. Great. So that's part of it. And then obviously, like I said, the SU assessment. And then um, working with them through obviously all the work that Amy did on the special revenue funds, making sure that those are all up updated and appropriately documented for in your audit. So those are the items okay. that we're still working through for yours. Any questions for Tara on that audit update? All right, then the announced tuition. So new this year, you saw a different form. Yeah. Um, so this is actually the Agency of Education's form. I got mine. Okay. I didn't remember to print that one um, from home. So this takes into account um, how the AOE determines your allowable tuition rate once we file our stat book. So I'm using this form moving forward. So you'll see it starts right off at the top, what your projected enrollment is, which is 97 currently. And then it takes your expenditure budget, and this was done on the, the last draft, so obviously, you know, it changes, but we don't change your announced tuition rate once if, if, after we change the budget. Then we back out the expenditures that are not included in allowable tuition, which is your assessments to the supervisory union and um, any tuition payments. So your secondary tuition payments don't count in your um, announced tuition rate. So that's all backed out. And then the projected offsetting revenue is backed out. And then um, they take that and divide it by your enrollment. 
So we have a projected announced tuition rate of $16,141. And then I had given you in the packet the memo, which gives you the historical announced tuition rates. Um, so you could see where you have been. And you didn't change it last year. You stayed consistent at the $16,950. And what is the um, what is the cautionary um, of announcing a tuition rate higher than what we don't build back interdistrict, um, so we chose as a supervisor union as a whole that if your um, announced tuition if your allowable tuition rate comes in higher than what you announced, we do not build back your the Granville Hancock Unified District in Pittsfield, which are the two districts that send into our SUD. Um, we don't build them back. So otherwise, if we as a supervisory union chose to do that, that is where you get those tuition bill backs, which in the past have been pretty substantial from not appropriately allocated announced tuition rates. Meaning if we were too low and the actual amount came yeah. in higher, we don't over. bill back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, um, and we don't credit back either, so you keep well, that's what I was wondering. Yes. It, no, by keeping it the same, it. It, it, it's, yep. okay. Yep. I, my, so saying, yeah, go ahead. Saying like it's a fixed cost regardless of whether it's higher or lower. Yep. Yeah, and I think that is a, um, I think billbacks have been, uh, are tough on, on districts to try to, to do, and I think yeah. that uh, that is um, wise that, our, um, that we don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, in our revenue budget, uh, the tuition that was used to calculate was this sixteen nine fifty. Yep. My recommendation would be to not to increase that at all, um, I, and to, to stay at that. I'm, we uh, the sheet shows that we um, could shave off a little bit, but on the other hand, um, you know that is that would be my suggestion. Is we we stay at the sixteen nine fifty. Mm -hmm. um, so Anybody have uh, comments or questions for uh, Tara? And we do this now because by statute, it has to be voted on by January 15th or you get whatever you had in the past. So that's why we do this before you approve a budget. Why does it say sixteen nine fifty up here? And then because this is if you go to the um, calculation, yeah, she the the sixteen one forty one is like the minimum. Well, it's been calculated. It's going to cost. That's the projected. That's the projected calculation. And so cost. you want to go with year twenty two. In twenty three, you are you have been sixteen nine. So the top one is what you're at in twenty three. Okay. And then down below is where you have been. So in twenty two, okay. twenty one, twenty. And so this is Got what you. on the towns of. Anybody who sends their child to Stockbridge or Rochester yeah. pays yeah. Uh, the district pays. Well, I'll move that for FY twenty four tuition is sixteen thousand nine fifty. Second. Bill First two. Robert second. Is there any uh, discussion? <laughs> Being no discussion. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. The ayes have it. The tuition. Rate is set at sixteen nine fifty. Perfect. Thank you, Tara. You're welcome. And then, do you want me to stay for your discussion on the funds? Or are you good? Uh, yeah. If you can. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm to jump in. So, um, great update uh, about the. Oh, I printed that out and I left her out on the printer, didn't I? Update on the. Um, Endowment funds, um, do you, everybody received the email that I sent them uh, earlier this month that kind of just gave a summary on the uh, four different um, endowment funds that Rochester, um, that we have uh, from the Rochester side? Yep, word summary. Um, I did read through that. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's uh, Tara is in the process of of getting paperwork 
<laughs> all squared away. Um, I'm trying to find all your notes here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm going to print that out and left it on my I was going to hand them to you so you can see that. Okay, thank you. That's great. So um, give them all back. Great. So um, we do have a couple different funds. Uh, the Fund for Excellence uh, was uh, an anonymous donor. It was specifically for the principal to use as her discretion. Um, we haven't used any of it uh, since we've been a district. Uh, the funds have grown, but of course in the past few months, the, as the, the stock market is changing, so the <laughs> funds are not growing. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I don't really know where to go with this. What are we trying to do here? So, directly benefit students for opportunities for learning in recreation and ministry. Well, for, it seems to me, and I haven't been here very long, that for the first time, thanks to your efforts and diligence, that the SU board has in front of them an uh, understanding of what endowments are under our responsibility, where they stand financially, what's the purpose of each endowment. Mm -hmm. Tara has also added how um, they may be expended relative towards uh, income. And uh, so we have that, and we can build on that each year, and we can yes. decide. I think one of your recommendations, we don't have to decide tonight whether some of these funds would be better managed through a professional financial management uh, process, and I think that's something we should uh, consider, put on a future agenda item. It doesn't have to be now. I do have um, a meeting, um, just an update on that, though. I do have a meeting with one of our lenders um, who has a financial management team, yeah. and it's the lender that handles your tax anticipation notes. I have a meeting with them this week um, to go over each of your funds and to see you know, what they could do and provide for services, because I do have other districts that also have funds similar to yours that I'll be meeting with them on. So I should have also yeah, some more updated great. information at our next meeting. Yeah, um, we've got a really dynamite um, team that's, that's, that's helping Stockbridge. So I just, before we make a decision, I'd like to see uh, what you've got going. So, or, or, excuse yeah. me, not, I take that back. I'm personalized. I think the board should... Right. You should have a, a clear understanding on that. I'm sorry. And if you have any recommendations, Bill, I'm happy to meet with others as well. Yeah, uh, I love that uh, fund that, um, through that. Yeah, if you want to uh, send me that. Absolutely. And there's, with the market down now, it's a great time to invest. Uh, you don't, you, you don't want to, when it's here, you want to do it here and let it right. come on up. So uh, thank you for all your work on, on doing this as well as ever, all your other Burdens. Just might want to stay away from Elon Musk right now. Uh, <laughs> well, I, no, I don't know if he's going to be su supplying the all electric buses through um, uh, <laughs> tes Tesla. I don't know, but thank you. It's important. Okay, um, so I guess that's kind of where we are with these. Is that it, we just keep it at the forefront of our uh, minds, and and uh, Tara's working on it, and we'll be meeting with. I think the uh, advice about looking into financial management for um, us to look at that idea is a right way to go. Thank you. All right. I think that was the last thing. That's the last thing that we have. Yep. Okay. Are we at 10 4? Well, I'm a little confused if we're continuing on with discussion items or circling back to the reports of the board with the poll the um, nine, four, five, and six. Do we need to wait for so, a I'm celebration go, of yeah. learning? I'm going to go yes. leave Jamie uh, from Grace. So if we do celebration of learning, ten four. I, if we could postpone to next meeting, okay. because I would like Matt to be here and he had a conflict. Okay. So we're tab tabling 10 4. We're going to table 10 4. Uh, I think we're going to do the celebration of learning now. Um, and so that uh, Jamie has time to come back, and then we will continue on from there. Got it. So the celebration of learning. 
is kind of the flip side, like you saw the office discipline referrals in that report. Well, here's some of the proactive uh, pieces, and it just kind of highlights it. It's pretty short. It was a tough night to ask anyone to come and present that last <laughs> few moments of uh, people's vacation, so I tried to take it off folks' plate. Um, so this summer, just to back up, we sent, oh, I lost my sticky note, or she took my sticky note. We sent nine teachers and staff members to what's called responsive classroom training, which really focuses on building a morning meeting, uh, building relationships and routines and expectations through strategies such as modeling and scaffolding, which means you do it step by step, day by day. So they don't walk in on day one and are expected to know what morning meeting looks like or what their reading block looks like or anything along those lines. It's really to focus on building a positive community. Um, it goes hand in hand with our PBIS, which is our positive behavior um, intervention systems. So it really emphasized, it was four days um, in July that folks went to that, and that was through some ESSER funding. And then we had a team of four, which was in, uh, five, including myself, which uh, was our targeted team that went to the positive behavior intervention systems, which is called uh, training in June, which is called BEST Institute. Um, and that focused on specific training around looking at data and targeted plans and supports to put in place. But these are strategies that we use for every student, every classroom, preschool through sixth grade. So every student starts their day uh, with a morning meeting. And to the right is the morning greeting or message uh, live from today <laughs> for tomorrow. Um, then there's some sort of share activity, um, which uh, depending on the age group is uh, the different guidelines. Um, responsive classroom also gives you a lot of prep. So it could be, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? Or um, if you could travel in time backwards, what time would you travel to and why? Different prompts like that. Um, and then a group activity, which is always the highlight. This is usually an energizer or get to know you. Popular one is called fraud detector, which means they like sit with their eyes closed and one student is picked to uh, send the like you're out message and usually by sticking their tongue out at someone, which is why it's super popular. And then another person is the detective and has to try and guess. Um, and then it kind of ends with this, this is what your day is, this morning message. Um, so it sets the goal and the tone for this respectful, engaged learning. Um, and really a climate of trust, because you can't do these activities in a classroom if you don't trust your peers or your teachers to make sure that it's going the right way. They're about 20 minutes long, morning meetings anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes long. Um, it's really made a huge difference uh, just in how students interact with each other. They can help explain routines. We've had several new families move in. We have a uh, two new families that have moved in, one in each building, one in December and one starting um, this week. And students are able to teach those new friends what to do and how things work through this. So it's, it's making gains and it's great that we're doing it vertically. So they know that that's what's, even when they change classrooms, they're still gonna have morning meeting and they know what the structure of morning meeting looks like. So that's one um, aspect, a proactive aspect that we're trying to do. Now, by by telling them what, what's upcoming for the day, you're saying yeah. kind of sets the tone? Sets the tone. It's where you get your jobs for the day, who's line leader, the primary grades. That's an no, important that's one. Yeah. Um, you know, who's uh, in math, in number corner, like who gets to be the calendar person and turn the card over and run number corner. Um, who's the office runner? There's a wide range of jobs. I took a snapshot of one. I think it's in a later slide that just kind of shows it. All those things happen in that morning meeting. It's the beginning so, of managing your day. And, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I exactly. Guess, guess. And we all think like, what are the things we need to do today? Right. Well, starting do you to train them on. Find that. doing that can also help with the transitions through the day because they know what's because they know what's expected. coming. Like tomorrow will be hard, right? They haven't been in school for 12 yeah. days. It'll be hard to get back in a routine, and each day will get a little easier. Um, I think the piece about this is that it's structured the same now in every classroom. So even though it changes, the games might change, the group activity might change, the share might change as they get older, 
some of the constants are the same. Figuring out what your jobs are, going over your schedule of the day, those are all the same no matter what grade you're in. And that does make that transition from one classroom to the next yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I use a timer for my kids when it's time to go. Right. Like if I don't do that, it's like a so, disaster. Right. I'm like, you got 10 minutes, I put it on my phone. Exactly. And that goes off, they're all right, they're ready right. to go. And the more visual, that was kind of something yeah. else that came out of this responsive classroom training, the more visuals we can provide because students can't necessarily read social studies yeah. or science. Like they, they associate an image with it first. The more visuals we can put into place for students, That's like cool. a visual timer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more successful things are. So this That's responsive cool. classroom was way more than just building your morning meeting, but it was a lot of things like that. How to yeah. build in your visual timers, things like coming back from lunch and recess and pretty much every group at lunch and at the end of lunch and recess either has quiet time which is like 10 minutes no talking you can color you can read to self you can just be in your own space or it's like a read aloud and they're drawing during it and that was a responsive classroom tool you can't expect students to come back from recess and lunch which is high yeah. energy because they're so excited to be with each other and pretty much as long as we're you know, following some pretty simple rules, they get to, like, it's the one part of their day that's not super controlled for them. So to come back and, oh, by the way, now we're going to sit here and practice writing, like, that's not something that they're going to thrive in. Right. So this 10 minutes, um, and the responsive classroom training, I attended it as well. You learn how to do everything by they walk you through it the way you should implement it. So like we only learned uh, a share the first day. Like we all circled up in morning meeting as adults and had to learn the share, how to oh, do cool. the share activity. Yeah. So it was very um, great. And now we're gonna go back to them for two half day trainings on managing misbehavior and using some of the strategies we've built this way. Yeah. This is actually really good to see. Um, when they transition on to the other schools, uh -huh. you know, you have um, homeroom or right. advisory. Exactly. And that's your one moment in the morning where you can kind of put your whole day together with your advisory right. if you have issues, you know, anything like that to talk about, kind of your right. your settle into the school day routine. And so this, you know, as they as they get older and move on, it's still something, most of the yeah. middle and high schools, you know, already have been doing this, you know, for all well, since exactly. we were there. So It'll be a good transition. How long is it, um, the morning meeting? How it's about 20 to 30 minutes. Some some teachers will pair it up with number corner, so they'll jump right into some math as part of it. Okay. Yeah. Others just do it as its own entity, and it's, mm -hmm. it's rough, roughly about 20 minutes. I think some days, depending on the group activity, um, the kids would like it to be longer. <laughs> but then on the flip side of that, we also do something called closing meeting at the end of the day. So they all circle up, and the circle piece is important too, so they can see everybody's eyes and mm -hmm. have that face-to-face -face contact. Um, and they talk about what was easy or hard about their day and kind of decompress and unpack the day too. And that's five to ten minutes, and five is probably more spot on because your day kind of tends to run long and <laughs> the bus dismissal is getting called and those other things. But um, it's something that we've implemented throughout both buildings. It's been great. Great. Yeah. So the next piece is really on building routines and expectations in the classroom. So you can see there's different helpers, different jobs, and then visual schedules. Every classroom has a visual schedule mm -hmm. up. Uh, we found that's been a huge component and things that help kids. Um, to know, like, kids will go up and be like, nope, we're right here. Don't try and move anything, because <laughs> that's where we're supposed to be. And they know, sometimes because they can read the words, but other times because they also just know the order of schedule. Um, so that's been something we've really been building in. Um, and not just in classrooms. There was, as long as it wasn't knocked over, like there's hallway expectations. Like you don't run down the hallway, you walk down the hallway. There's, um, and it's all things about what you're expected to do, not what you shouldn't do. So I just gave you a bad example, but we walk in the hallway, our voice level is a zero, which means voices are off, so you don't interrupt what's going on in other classrooms. And um, we spent six weeks of school, the first six weeks of school, you 
you start, the first week is nothing but teaching routines and expectations. And then you start to scale in the academics and build up how, this is how we do our phonics work. This is how we do this. So they learn the how to, um, and we provide an example and a non-example. So especially at this point in the year, when students come back tomorrow, it'll be a lot of focus on routine and reminding of routine and expectations um, through this is how we should do it versus this is how we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that just creates a clear boundary again for students and it's modeled visually. Um, we also, through PBIS, recognize students for meeting expectations. So they get either a ticket or a hand. It's called something different in each building, but it's literally this big piece of paper. And you're recognized by adults for saying, you know, thank you for being ready to learn by having your pencil out and being at your seat. And uh, all our learning around social, emotional learning and praise is that for every one redirection, you should have five positive reinforcements. And that helps um, students to understand what they should be doing and wanting to meet that. Kids want to meet what the expectation is at the end of the day. Um, and again, we teach those not just in the classroom, but playground, lunch, hallway, bus, specials classes, all those different places. Go ahead. And then we recognize students, not just through our hands or our tickets, but we also do student of the month or racket of the month. Um, it's once a month. Uh, our fifth and sixth grade students lead the assembly. It's a script. It's um, in, students get to nominate peers who they th think should do it, and then adults also nominate. And there's representation from all the classes. Um, we do make sure that at some point in time, every student in each classroom is recognized. And all our um, classes come to that at the same time, so you get to see what other students are being recognized for. And then classroom celebrations, so those tickets or those hands, they total up, the kids count every month. And you can be, um, you have a classroom goal and we have a school goal, but in the classroom goal, um, they will get to pick something fun. Pajama day is always popular, crazy hair day is popular. Um, cooking, you usually start to see some bigger classroom celebrations as the year goes on. They like to do more. Um, some teachers do a poll at the end of the day to recognize someone because they all go in one collective area. We actually have two students from Stockbridge. Our 456 teacher in Stockbridge does something called a row bank. Her last name's Ro, so she does the row bank. And students can trade them in like currency for different things and that and use them how they want. And we had two students save up 125 hands in Stockbridge is what they're called to be superintendent for the day. Oh. So this coming Friday, That's awesome. from, I don't think they know what they got themselves into, but does he does. He was very open to it. He picked the day. So this coming Friday, those two students will go. It's more like an afternoon, but they'll go for a whole afternoon with him and get to see what it's like at central office and then go to another school okay, and see what a different school is like and what he does when he goes to other schools. So um, like their own currency you're saying? Yeah, like they, there's a list of things she has. So for like 25 hands, you can have, um, I think it's 25. They can cash in lunch mm -hmm. uh, and from the pit stop with me. Or they can, for five hands, they can get a piece of gum or, gotcha. Yeah. Or I think it's like 70 hands, um, they can pick an, a class-wide game. So they try and do different things. Because um, for older students, the buy-in is not as exciting as when you're younger and there's crazy hair day and there's pajama day and there's right. things like that. Right. So the um, five, six, the, the money that they, they yeah. feel like they're, they're getting, getting something. something. Right. Or, so uh, we used to do bridge bucks there. There was a teacher, four, fifth and sixth was Miss Bridges and we did bridge bucks. And it was very similar. Yeah. Or we would all bring things from home that we didn't want uh -huh. and you would exchange, pay, uh, exchange money. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, it's just, it really depends on the group of kids in the classroom. It's pretty kid 
driven, which is cool, what their celebrations can be. Um, and then same with all school celebration, which is what's next, I think, if I remember correctly. So um, this is when we meet a school-wide goal. So for example, at the beginning of December, each school earn, had earned more than 3,000 hands or tickets uh, collectively. And so now they have another goal, and I think it's like 4,500 in each building. Um, and then they get an all-school celebration. They're about 20 to 30 minutes. The ideas come from students. It's a brainstorm list that comes from morning meeting, and they all get to participate in it. So we've done dances. We've done games with bagels. We've done uh, different, like they just did a winter craft going into uh, vacation. Um, I'm trying to think what else. All school hikes. So there's usually one bigger one at the end of the year. Makes they them all feel like they're really part of this collaborative effort. Yeah. So. And nice. um, it is the groupings of students is K through six. And preschool sometimes too will join. It just depends on what the activity is. But um, so it's not just like five sixes by themselves. Like they are with other kids. And it really mm -hmm. creates a lot of leadership opportunities, which has been great. Mm -hmm. We've made chocolate chip cookies before we've done a lot of different things so great they really enjoy it so those are kind of it's like the flip it seemed like a good time to do the flip side of the discipline <laughs> uh referrals but that's kind of a snapshot of what goes in on social emotionally excellent oh, yeah. yeah you're really neat thank you yeah you're welcome does anybody have any questions for Lindy on uh, the celebration of learning? That was great. I love this part of our meeting. Well, I do too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Now I don't know where you go. Yeah, I guess we're going to move on to the policy committee and draft three of the flag policy and, and corresponding documents. So I think. I'm going to in here. Okay, right after. Uh, oh. Here we are. How far down is it? No. There. Okay, so Patrick, you're on the policy committee? Yes. Uh, and this is the most draft of the uh, flag policy that um, is being recommended, is that correct? Yeah, and we we uh, motion to move it, I believe, right? Yeah, out of our committee. So okay. now, essentially, we're just looking for feedback from uh, from the, the local boards. And okay. Um, did everybody see Bill's um, email and, and his uh, yeah. first questions? Um, uh, I did um, do a little uh, just internet searching on you know the flag policies and what's been going on in in Vermont and with the different other schools and such and good um, good good. One thing I thought was uh, very interesting is one of the, the Fairfax uh, school board member specified that the policy was a flag pole policy and not a flag policy. Mm -hmm. And I kind of liked that thought that we are actually talking about what the flag pole, what goes on the flag pole. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, it's. It's, it's tough. It's, it seems you, like a, a, deep, that, a deep issue here, um, and I, I do agree with uh, Bill's statement. I guess that that's my opinion. Um, that that there could be a lot of potential um, issues that arise up by um, by having the opportunity to fly other flags than. Um, possible other flags on our flagpole, um, and to for the board to have to make the decisions on what flags are appropriate and are not appropriate versus, um, you know, not running into any discrimination issues around that. Um, I think it puts the board at a uh, to liability there. Um, 
But uh, Bill, wanna, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, the, if we go beyond the flag as a symbol and we talk about the underlying, the most important thing underlying that issues is something goes way back, and that is um, social and racial justice, social and racial equity. And I come from a generation that grew up with, um, with that issue front and center. Um, a few years ago, uh, John Lewis died, who was um, a phenomenal civil rights leader that put his body and his life on the line at Bloody Sunday down in, in um, Selma in March of 65. And um, there are, shortly thereafter, there are 24 students from Syracuse University that went down to Louisiana. Why? Because one of the students um, was down there the summer before trying to register voters and almost got, um, didn't come back. And just so happened that the Ku Klux Klan firebombed two black churches between Bloody Sunday. And um, it was a tough time if you go back to the 60s, um, if you read about them or you, the, whatever you want, the movies, everything else. So you had not only Bloody Sunday, but you had the reign of terror in uh, rural Louisiana. You had um, freedom riders that were being killed in Mississippi. Um, you had um, a woman by the name of Viola Lauso, who was a volunteer from Detroit, drove down there trying to help out. And she was gunned down while she was driving in her car because she picked up a black person, we called Negroes back then, because he had run out of gas and she was going to drive him to a local filling station to fill up. Um, and it was weird because the FBI told the students before they left Syracuse University that they couldn't ensure, they warned the students they couldn't ensure their safety much below Cincinnati. Now just think about that for a second, much below Cincinnati. So these students went down anyway. Um, below Cincinnati, Cincinnati the black students hunched down so they it didn't look like they had an integrated car. Um, when they got into Louisiana, the cars didn't go faster than the speed limit, but they were literally bumper to bumper because of the experience of the Freedom Riders was that um, uh, the laggard car could be cut off and those students could be isolated and in some cases killed. Um, they made it down there. They were welcomed by a cross, um, a, a cross burning f on their Freedom House door. Um, they started rebuilding a church. Um, it was eventually completed. They marched with students who, high school students that left the high school because this is a Negro school, lousy plumbing, leaking roofs, uh, the library with the shelves empty or with books going back to the 40s or 50s, uh, their, their, their coach being fired because the coach attended one of their uh, rallies. And um, the Syracuse students joined them. And as a result, uh, the governor of the great state of Louisiana came, apologized, and promised that they'd turn some things around. My point is that students, no matter what their age, can make a difference. And we need students today to make a difference. And racism and, and, and uh, attacks on LGBTQ are continuing today. We read about it in the paper. We've dealt with it in our own SU. And so this issue is extremely important. The reason I came up with my amendment is that we want to focus on how, how can we continue to make sure that um, social justice equity is in our programs, is in our hearts, it's in our schools and all our activities. And I'm concerned about 
if the issue is a flag rather than the underlying uh, beliefs of what we should be doing, um, that can disrupt us, that can get people confused, that can get people angry. And that's, that disunity is just at a time that public education and our, what we're doing here is more and more somewhat challenged and important. And so I would like to think that we can make sure, and as part of our the leadership team, to make sure the right things are happening in our schools. But we do not have to prove that by having our flagpole that all these years has been for governmental flags um, raises another flag. Now, what's unique about what Patrick's committee has done is because they've looked at all these scenarios and we've had school committees that have said, no, it, the flag is only the American flag and the Vermont flag. And others said, um, no, uh, there should be a student um, uh, petition process that would be reviewed by the administration and the school board to finally decide. What our, our committee has done, policy committee has said, um, we're going to have not only a flag policy about a, the flagpole, but also representations within our schools. And it's leading it to the, to the school and it, to make that decision, correct? Yeah, and, and those decisions are made, that's the other thing, is it made by the school boards, whether it's the SU board and it, uh, for the various boards. So I think that's moving right in the right direction. What I'm concerned about is that through the second approach, which is students can petition and, and uh, show why they want to have representations and flags within the school building is important to them, why it is part of their education, it's part of their, uh, what they feel is important in our society to achieve or to try to achieve is important. We've, we, the, that policy within, allowing that within the school buildings, I think is, it should energize and certainly not dampen the enthusiasm of our students to try to do the right thing. To bring that outside and say, no, we've, we've got to have a flag, whatever that flag is going up and down that pole, I find uh, is not necessary to achieve that underlying goal, which is social and racial equity. And that's why I'm suggesting, and there's no vote of, um, Jamie was so nice to give us a po policy A30 that says basically we um, give feedback. The policy committee has been working on this for months. I think four or five months. They've gone through at least five or six drafts. Um, but I wanted to share my thoughts because I think the, the on, I think the SU board is meeting on January 24th. The policy committee has now voted unanimously for the policy that you have in front of you. They're going to be presenting that policy to the SU board. The SU board will either vote it, amend it, or, or send it back for further consideration. Uh, this is one idea that I feel very strongly about because I want the underlying goals of what we're all about as human beings not to be thwarted. But at the same time, our task as, uh, as school leaders we need a united community. We're, in fact, a symbol of united community as being a public school. And I'd hate to see that unity unnecessarily torn apart. Um, so that's, that's what I've got all about here. Thank you. So just for that, so, the, so Bill's right. So this policy was crafted in a way that you as a Rochester Stockbridge Unified District could say that you are the only, it, it starts by saying the only flags flown are for the Vermont United States flag. A district could choose to have the area of display be the flagpole. And that's something that a district can choose yep. to do. I think where we're, across the SU, I think where we are, this was a compromise within the policy committee to try to meet Everybody's Every needs. district's needs. Yeah. Um, there are some districts that are very passionate about wanting to be, have the ability to designate the flagpole as a place that, where students could fly mm -hmm. a proposed flag. And so that's, that's why this Leaving policy was crafted the way it was. Yeah. 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 It's, 
it's just yeah, it's hard to just to explain convincingly why this flag and not that flag. It's just whew. well, I mean, I think um, I think you have. We go through this process, but I'm talking about I'm on the street, I'm driving down the street, I see that flag waving, and I'm saying, okay, well, I've got a flag. Why can't that? Well, this is very, I understand reading this, why, but I'm not sure the, the, the person in, um, that live in our communities are going to read all the fine print and say, oh, yeah, that and not that. Um, so, and the other thing about it, it gets going to be harder is, let's just say, we say only we say we're going to reserve our flagpoles for the Vermont flag and the um, United States flag, and then in, in Bethel, they vote to have not only the governmental flag but the non-volunteer flag there. They're going to say, well, why that and not why in your community and not that community? We become it's almost like a political football here. How do when you have that, that ability for each district to decide, and I don't think it's, I can quite honestly understand the in-building differentiation because you have different grades and classes and, and all that sort of stuff, but on a flagpole, I'm going to convincingly say, well, we're right in this district, but they're right on that, even though they're different. I think that's going to be a, a, a hard thing, and that's one reason policy that I propose is on the flagpoles, it's we reserve it for the governmental and inside the schools that can do whatever the school boards and the, and the principals want. I understand that there's passion on this. I'm passionate on this. Uh, my generation is passionate on this. And we feel, not we, I personally feel that we need to do more. So I'm sounding like kind of weird because I'm maybe proposing something that sounds like it doesn't advance that. Uh, in my life, the flags didn't matter. It was the kids getting out there and doing things, their parents doing out there and doing things. And um, we can still do that and be believe passionately in that um, and reserve the flags for the United States and, and Vermont. Um, I, I would think there's going to be quite a debate, and I don't know what they're going to come down on that, but I just wanted to share that, that feeling with you. I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> Is there any other comments on that, uh, on the flight policy and, and uh, Bill's um, um, oh. st stance on it? Um, just if we're going yeah, help to me to here. And the SU or to the policy committee, um, is this something that our board is feeling the same on, or is this just individual? No, I, I guess for my question would be, OK, well, with these two scenarios, what what outlining factor is, is going to make the difference between there being a conflict arising, whether the flag's on the wall inside or on the flagpole outside? Is it, it for you, are you, in your mind, is it the fact that now the whole community is seeing this coming by and now you have outside members from the school that are now involved in this policy as opposed to just the students inside or faculty or parents that are, are in the building? Is that, I mean, because I'm just trying to understand what's the difference? Yeah. yeah. Um, one is the difference, and it is visibility. Mm -hmm. um, why can't I have this flag? Okay. I, and there's an answer to every request. Mm -hmm. um, but it's awfully hard for those proponents. Uh, I want to have the blue stripe uh, American flag shown because I believe our police are being. Totally, blah, 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 blah. So how do you say no to that? How do you say no to the Galliston flag, which is don't tread on me, which is a historic flag that now has been, it, it, it's now in, in the political process seen as representing something else. It's, there's no win. There's, as I call it in this, this, this is a zero sum game outside. Uh, what we have in the schools, though, is we've got, the whole environment. We've got plays, classrooms, literature, readings, poetry, um, musical events, um, all those things that you can express. And the flag is another one. But it's what a perfect setting. Look at us here. Um, and uh, so 
I, I, I think there's an opportunity in the building to, to do everything we're trying to do as educators. That's, that's the reason. Um, and I'm, quite honestly, I, we need the vote. We need people to believe in us. Even if the, oh, I'm sorry, taking too long, but the last thing is this. Our job is not to make what's the political correct decision. Our job is to do what's right. And we've recently done that as an SU. We've done that with the anti-racism policy. That took a long time, a lot of drafting. Um, it wasn't unanimously uh, liked or appreciated in our communities, but it was the right thing to do, and it's a hugely important building block. We have another one on transgender students. Um, another thing that we fulfilled our mission, our job is to do things like that, whether it's politically correct or not. I happen to think that to, to say, no, we'll reserve our flagpoles for what they've been flying is, is, is not discriminatory uh, in a negative way. And I'm, um, so that's why, I don't know. Thank yeah, you. no, I'm, I'm not one way or the other. I'm just no, oh, and, and please, uh, nice thing about our group, Best. we can disagree. Yeah. Um, and we learn and we respect each other. So I, I'm not asking for anything, loyalty or whatever it is. I'll just ask you to, to think about it because uh, it, it, it is important Thank for the God. kids as well as is for our whole SU. Now, Jamie, you mentioned that there are districts, though, that are for like adamant about using yeah, the polls. Is there a reason? representations yeah. on your policy committee. I'd like to take Justine's yeah, question next. She had her hand up for a while. Justine. Hi. It's not a necessarily a question. It's more of my opinion about the flagpole in general. Like, uh, it kind of piggybacking on, on Bill. I, at the same time, I, I, as I like the idea of the in-school forum, um, I also recognize that I don't think it's necessarily going to do the trick for what the whole point of this concept is, because it's not it's going to be within a building where it's not a broad political statement. So I feel like it's kind of pushing it into a less important category than maybe what the purpose of this it, you know, request is. But that being said, I, I sort of see us as a board as being representative of the greater community. And by making these decisions on specific political stances, I, I'm not sure that that's our role. I feel kind of awkward making that decision and voting on this political um, choice when it's based on what you know maybe students are proposing, but then we're deciding, yeah, we want to support that. Um, I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of a weird relationship between school and the greater community because we're making, you know, we'll essentially make this decision on what we think the school's political stance is, and we're going to fly the flag. So I feel I I I like the. I like the idea of being able to have the forum within the school, I, though I recognize it doesn't, um, it, it kind of da um, dampens the importance of the concept, but I also feel awkward in voting for this political stance just based on, you know, some students within a community. I don't know if it's our role to be voting for that, that kind of. Thank you. Yeah. Pat. Uh, no, I think Justine brings up a good point, and I have a thought about that. I mean, if if we don't want that to sit, I mean, the whole point is for the students to have a voice. So why couldn't there be a process involved where, say, the final say is the board, but why can't the students vote? Yeah, I still, I, I go back to just what Justine just said, though. I mean, it's not our role to make the political decision, polit you know, the political statement. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, that's what a lot, what it is. And, and what I was saying earlier is, um, you know, making a political statement, it, I mean, that's weighty. And also, you, you don't want to discriminate against any, any group for making a, a decision of, one way or the other. Um, it's very tricky. So um, by eliminating the, that statement outside eliminates that potential um, problem area. 
Um, but by having a forum inside for the students to um, voice. To, to voice and to, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Robert? Um, well, I know it's always uncomfortable to be forced into a, a political statement one way or another, but in our anti-racism or our, our uh, LGBTQ um, uh, policies, I mean, whether we like it or not, in this climate, we're making a political statement. So, and we're being, we're, we're, we're making it, and the, the question is, is um, you know, that may be uncomfortable, but if we're re truly backing those policies, sometimes we have to, we have to get uncomfortable and, and air it. Whether that goes to um, uh, doing it on a flagpole is, is certainly a valid question. But it's, I think we're, we're, we're um, forced to air uncomfortable, un uncomfortable um, statements in support of our policies. Right, that's our reading before the policy comes out. Yes, Justine. I think, well, I disagree with that statement because I feel like discrimination, racial discrimination is, is, is law. And, and how we deal with that in our, in our school is, is civil rights. And it's, there's, there's legal implications in that. But, but flying a flag, showing a political stance is not. You can fly nothing and you're not breaking the law. But if you're racially discriminating against students, you are breaking the law. So I think that they're totally different. Um, and I just wonder, you know, I do think it's inadequate to have just the, the kids be able to express themselves in a, in a private forum. I think that's not the point of this. I wonder if there's another public forum we could offer them that does not allow for us to be making a political decision or statement that it, it you know, shows that we're deciding something for our community, but given, you know, some other way that, that the, they could have a night where they're presenting or some other political um, public forum where it's not just inside, we're not shutting it in a door, you know, within the school, but we're not making a decision as a district that we believe a certain political stance. No. Hmm. No, I just want to uh, ride with that because I outside it's very hard to see the flagpoles uh, other than a political statement inside the school. What's in the school classrooms? What's in the school? The gymnasium? What's in the school? An auditorium? So uh, talking about what Justine is talking about, you can have a concert that that that, that highlights any number of a musical uh, tributes or, or genres that, that, that tell a story. We can have plays, there are tons of plays uh, that our drama club can put on to tell a story. Um, and, and that's open and you want the public to come and attend. Um, it's, that's inside the building, this is an educational decision. It's, it's harder to see an educational decision when you, you step outside and stare at those flagpoles. It's very hard not to say, Gee, that's our flagpole, even though technically it's under the school department's rules and regulations. This is our school. This is our flagpole. But inside that school, I think there are opportunities, Justine, where the, 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 that voice and that message can be conveyed to the public. They also have student newspapers. Um, they have take-home material that um, they've got um, journals, they've got yearbooks, they've got all sorts of things. They've got letters to the editor to, to tell the story they want to tell. Yeah, absolutely. I just mean, um, it, instead of just, it, to me, it seemed like, well, maybe there could be another place they could put their flag. Mm -hmm. That's what I was how yeah. I was taking yeah. your, your, your idea. Um, and to me, that's kind of like, well, that's just shutting them in a building. Yeah. So, okay. So, just real quick, I think it's important for the board to know this has come about because a student group petitioned a board mm -hmm. to fly the pride flag in June yeah. at one of our member districts. And 
that district's board answer was no because we didn't have a flag policy yeah. governing it. So that's where this came from. So I just think to give perspective from some of our district boards, that that is why this policy was drafted, is that the White River Unified District Board requested that the SU pursue a flag policy. Right. Could be any flag that was asked that mm -hmm. gets mm -hmm. asked to put be put up though. So, uh, but I, th I think at this point we, it's not out of uh, it's come out of the policy committee and it's at the SU for them to look at. Um, well, I'm going to warn it for a vote because I we got to move on. So I'm going to warn it for a vote at the SU at the SU level in January, and the board can decide to move on this or not because it's been kicked back to policy twice, okay. the committee. The committee's been unanimous, and I think we just got to get an answer on it. Um, well, so that we, Because we have other policy work to do yeah. as well. I'd recommend going to that meeting to voice uh, no. any opinions one way or the other, and uh, we, we'll see where it goes um, from there, and it will be brought to our board for us to uh, review, uh, amend, or um, accept. So we'll, we'll have our, our own opportunity yep. with that. Yeah, thanks for... Be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. For listening and sharing. I appreciate you. All right. 9-5, uh, policy review. Uh, policy A30, rule and adoption of uh, school board policies. Um, this is probably just put in because we are trying to go through... I'm just going to try to go through a yeah. different policy every month. Yep. Yeah, and I think it's good. See the time time timely. A policy about a policy. policies. About yeah. policy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, so Jessica knows, yeah, we, we realize we're, we just want to try to keep up with going through what our policies are and review them, make sure that, <clears throat> yep, we're still on board with that, or if we had any, um, you know, concerns. I I didn't have any concerns with, with this policy or anything that I felt we needed to um, change. It's nice, it's nice to reread. I'd be, be familiar with them. Uh, did anybody have any um, other comments or any um, anything to discuss regarding uh, 95, the policy review? Um, I just wanted to, in research, researching the flag policy and all that, I was looking at a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases. And there was one most recent in the city of Boston where they allowed flags to fly. And uh, they finally turned down a flag. and. Uh, that was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court voted eight to one that the city of Boston uh, was an error. One reason they were an error was they didn't have a policy. And so what are policies, why we have policies, and why we have a process of creating policies really goes back to if you don't, you can get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And you don't serve your organization well at all. So um, the nice thing is that our supervisory union has got a bunch of them, and they, they're pretty darn sound, so thank you. Great. Uh, if there's no further comments, we'll move on to 9-6. Uh, um, is there any? Yeah, just uh, real quick, and Bill, you can jump in. It's just uh, we adopted uh, the SU budget for 23-24. Um, it's essentially, if and you could see that in your assessments update, it's pretty much flat between special ed and all the other offices. And the, and the reasoning for that is we continue to be able to um, realize some savings in special education based on the alternative programming nice. that we've built. So we, we have alternative programming. We had it grades um, two through eight. We've expanded that through nine through 12. Um, and so it's resulted in us being able to save some money in out-of-district tuitions. Yeah. Um, that budget does support an additional 2.0 FTE. One's a uh, 504 coordinator, which will coordinate 504s for secondary um, schools across the SU, like for our sub, for those students who um, get 504 services in those schools, that person would be at those meetings to really make certain that we are monitoring those secondary 504s once they leave our buildings. So I'm excited about that. And it does budget for one more uh, special educator at, at the 9 through 12 level. That was most of the work at the at the full board this past month was was the budget really getting adopted and we definitely did talk about policy a little as well, which is uh, we're working on a drafted policy uh, for board member um, conduct. We always adopt the VSBA code of conduct 
um, at the start of the year at your annual reorg, but we're looking to provide a policy that provides um, really the parameters if someone didn't align their um, work as a board member in alignment to the code of conduct that folks um, say that they're going to abide by. So um, that there was a concern that had been raised, and it's they, we had multiple board members ask for a, a draft policy in that regard. So that will be forthcoming as well. That's all we got. Okay. Anything else, Bill? Anything else? Um, no, other than voting unanimously for the strategic plan. Oh, that's right. Yes. And our negotiations are still to kick, really kick off with uh, special oh, educators the because they're still they're still working on on their on proposals. their proposals, um, and we'll hopefully get together with them soon. Okay. Great. Well, we will move on then to ten six, the proposed sale of high school property and property line adjustment possible action. Um, who's going to take this one away? I've uh, given you a handout, and uh, basically there's a problem, and the, the background is in doing grant applications, if your property includes being in the um, floodway, it makes your application much more complicated. Um, in this case, the amount of property of the you know, proposed uh, sale of the high school just clips the um, the edge of the uh, floodway, and it's a non-essential piece. You look at the map, it's just this little triangle. And what we'd like to do is off that piece. Um, it doesn't really affect the status of the, of, we, we want to have that be go back to the, the uh, school district. It doesn't re really affect their status because there's a lot more other property that's in the floodway um, that the, the school will be retaining. So we just want to get rid of that little piece and that'll simplify our grant applications a lot. Now, uh, by the other sheets, there's a discussion of, um, of uh, um, with the uh, members of the Planning Commission that really um, we don't need to go through a subdivision process. We can just do a boundary line. Um, uh, adjustment. So what is, this is going to require is for um, the board to, um, the, the, the school district to have the survey done to get a new, new um, property line and then um, apply for the, the adjustment. As far as the, I've checked in the cost of uh, having the survey done will be uh, will be um, uh, uh, paid for by the, there's extra money left in the grant for doing the, the feasibility study. So it won't cost the, right. the, the school district, but we have to have the school. school Sign up on it. Well, it, first we have to have the, the school request the engineers to create that property line. And then we had, there's a form that's mentioned, and we have to um, apply for the property line adjustment based on a survey once it's complete. So I'm a little confused with the black line on this map. The area that we're discussing is this, um, it, the area that has uh, sideways lines. Yes, that's to, to put that area back into the school district. Right. Um, because it's what, in the floodway. Where, where is it exactly? Like pitch, like I know what the back of the school looks like. Is it, is it where the road is? Is it, is it, is it over the hill? Is it on that flat hit, flat part of the hill? Right. Is the field involved? Not probably not because of the hill there. Right. I, I, the you little know, like league field, the baseball right. diamond. I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, uh, Dick Robson's online. Dick, you there? Maybe not. Oh, yeah. I'm here. Maybe you could answer yeah. that question. Um, and that little section is uh, before the land drops off. So it's, um, it, it would be, let's see, um, uh, 
uh, out past where the dumpsters are, past the road. Okay. Um, Tor going towards the, the old soccer field. Um, I don't know where that is. The tennis court area, right? Is that what you mean? I was talking oh. about the girls' soccer field. Oh, there. that one came coming, coming back. Isn't that where the dumpster is? Is that you come on the road around the high school, and you get yeah. to, to the to the baseball diamond, but then the road keeps keeps going, and there's dumpsters, and the road would keep going to what used to be the high school soccer field. And is yes. it, is, is it that little area back there, kind of that road? Yes, it's before you get to the soccer field, okay. but it's after the dumpsters. And is the road part of it? I'm not, I, I'm sure the road goes through part of it, because but I couldn't know exactly. The road has, um, what do you call it when some, uh, the, the, does the town has access through that road, right? It's right a, um, a right away, thank you. There's a right away there. Does I that, think they already have the right away. I was just wondering if that complicated anything with yeah. with this. We just have to make sure that that, that same language of that right away is put back in. Because right, that gets down to the um, septic, the town septic. We, we would ask the surveyors to check on that. Yeah. Well, I see no problem with reclaiming some of that. Maybe we can even put our dumpsters back there. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, it was all all property before. Uh, There's all this this larger property before. Um, it's not going to cause us any additional issues because it's just field that is, was already in the floodplain <laughs> anyway. And um, I think it would help flood, out moving floodway. this forward. Floodway. Floodway. Excuse me. Floodway. Um, mm -hmm. So I would, that would be my opinion. I think it's fine. So any problems? Yeah, Jamie? it's kind of an extension of the outdoor education area. <laughs> yes, no, I, I think we're good. The side there, you know, so it would still, I mean, we probably would continue to use that area depending on whatever happened mm -hmm. with the high school property. So we, we, it could be quite useful to us right along that, that edge of the field in the, the riverbank. No, I think in general, when the surveying was done, it was just they lopped it off down, I, essentially down that middle. I think mm -hmm. they they were they were just trying to get, as you can see, the yeah the, they get the whole building yeah. into a space. So um, yeah, I said, so anybody want to make a motion? Take take action. I make a motion that uh, we direct the um, the Devoyen King mm -hmm. to uh, uh, adjust the. Um, Property line for the uh, uh, high school um, purchase, such that it eliminate it, it takes away the area that is in the flood away, and returns that as back to the elementary school parcel, and that the cost of that to be borne by the um, uh, the the grant that's. Um, uh, funded the feasibility study for the repurposing of the old high school, and that uh, on completion of that survey, that uh, the school, the school district will uh, apply for a property line adjustment. Second. That's a. Hope you got that. Thank you got that, Parker. Got the recording. Pause. All right. That was good, though, Robert. That was, yep. That was that was a very good one. Um, any discussion? Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. All right. 745. We are moving on to the board development study book. And I will be honest with you, I was not able to get through the chapter because I was busy reading a lot of other things. Um, <laughs> so I would, I would like to um, table it till next time. Um, I don't know what everybody else's opinions on that is. I, I read about a quarter of it, almost a half, but I didn't get through it. Yeah, I didn't get through it either, and I could do better. Yeah. They would give me time to catch up. I just got my book tonight. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, then let's, let's table that and pick it up again. And um, I know it is a lot of reading. We, there was definitely a lot to review this week, and I think we all did, you know, a pretty good job. Let's just, you know, stay on top of, you know, reviewing and reading and being prepared for our meetings and uh, 
Yeah, I mean, we're doing good. Let's just keep up the good work. And every effort we can put into it is, is better. And like I said, I, I myself as well. OK, so we're going to table that. Uh, we have. We did the uh, uh, announcement of tuition. We did. Yes. We're on the property line adjustment. Yes. So we were uh, new hires designation. Did you guys do your celebration learning? Yeah. Oh, I missed mm -hmm. it. I know. I did it while you were gone. That's all right. You're I'm trying fine. to. I'll, I'll go back and watch. <laughs> no, we do not have any. OK. Um, is there any public comment? OK. Next meeting is Monday, February 6th, 5.30 in Stockbridge. Uh, we will do book study, um, chapter three, as our future agenda item. And the solar. And the solar, the yeah. solar maybe. What's a good time for me to have Matt join us? It doesn't matter. Oh. What are you for saying? The guy for to the solar, percent. Matt Cooper, uh, Ray of Sunshine, who would do, he would be the one doing it. At so. the board meeting? Yeah. yeah, I want him to, the yeah. reason I wanted the table, I really want him to be there, and he was busy at the time, so. Well, we'll do budget first, probably. So I would say, let me, I'll, I can give you, within Wanna a week. Want to send me an email? Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. I can give you a couple week lead time. Cool. Amy and I start building the, I try to start building the agenda a whole week out before you guys. Yeah, then I, so that way I can work. We'll have a better in. sense then. Okay. Cool. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Or actually a, a request. Uh, I realized that I didn't make my, um, my motion long enough. <laughs> I request that uh, you get a quote on the survey and, and get and feed it back to us before we proceed, just to make need to make sure that there's enough money to cover it. Well, hopefully, since they've done it once, maybe they'll give us a, a, a deal because they already have all the information, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Yeah. OK. OK. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right.